Hello, my name is James Cooper, and I have the honor of representing Ward 2 on Oklahoma City City Council. I want to welcome you to June, which we will declare as Pride Month in just a few moments. But first, I'd like to talk to you about a problem I discovered about 10 years ago. As someone who calls Oklahoma City home, I was quite troubled to learn that I had no idea how Oklahoma City's 39th Street LGBT district was a district. I didn't know anything about its history. And so I've learned that when a problem exists, the only thing left to do is to identify the problem, then second, find out why it's a problem, and then thirdly, put forth some solutions. So first, I wanted to find out why 39th Street existed, how it came into its existence. And what I discovered was a renewed love for Oklahoma City and its history. And what I learned was that in its history, we would learn how we got to the present, and quite frankly, we would discover a roadmap for the future. Today, I'd like to talk about pride within a slightly different context than normally we have discussed it. And to do so, I'd like to begin with the Oklahoma City history I discovered 10 years ago. In fact, I'd like to read an excerpt from the book Boomtown by author Sam Anderson. And in this history, uh, I think you'll find some uh, some roadmaps forward as well. Two of our city's founders, Angelo and Lola Scott, settled into a home on Northwest 16th Street. Then, this was the absolute edge of the expanding city, at the northern border of the neighborhood of mansions. The Scott's house, by contrast, was spacious but understated. Angelo knew this area well from the days of the land run 26 years ago, when it had been the distant countryside, full of wildflowers, and he would ride out to escape the squabbling crowds of the city. Once, Scott wrote, he had gathered, quote, 26 varieties of flowers in less than as many minutes. From that distance, in those days, the city would have only been a speck on the horizon. Now, however, there were houses all the way, including his and Lola's. 16th Street was an in-between place, city to the south, country to the north, and at night, with their windows open to catch Oklahoma's cooling breezes, the Scots would have heard cows mooing. During the day, in the muddy distance to the north, they would have seen the cows grazing around the construction site of the new Capitol building, which they would have watched rising slowly over the course of several years, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Even out there, however, developers were beginning to buy up land. Oklahoma City's nowheres were disappearing fast, and it was possible to imagine a day when they would actually be outnumbered by the somewheres, the people, the structures, destinations, congregations. Someday, there would be no more countryside at all, no more cows, only houses, only cities. Well, this video is taking place in my neighborhood, where I call home, the Paseo. And it was only 10 years later that just a few blocks north of 16th Street, where Lola and Angelo Scott called home, the Paseo began. It began as the Spanish Village, and it was the first commercial shopping district constructed outside of downtown. Keeping in mind, downtown at the time, where our city began by the river, was where most of our people lived, where they worked, and where they shopped. So the idea that anyone would come as far north as, let's say, Northwest 23rd Street, was back then seemingly out of the question. A developer at the time, G.A. Nichols, decided that this was his opportunity to design a walkable, bike-friendly neighborhood, my neighborhood. His vision was simple, and it was the idea that when you walk out your front door, there should be sidewalks, crosswalks, streetlights, guiding the individual to their basic needs. The cleaners, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the parks, the schools, the places with recreation. Nichols also believed that in the event that the Paseo, again, Spanish Village at the time, did not have those basic needs, there should be reliable public transit connecting individuals back to the part of town where those needs were. And of course, as I mentioned, back then that was downtown. And back then that was a streetcar on Classen Boulevard that connected the Spanish Village to our downtown. So, when I decided to write about LGBT history 10 years ago in a cover story for the Gazette, a two-part story, part of my plan was to address the problem, in other words, describe the history that too often goes untold about Oklahoma City's LGBT community. And the hope was that 
well, let's take the Paseo's uh, blueprint. Let's take that and let's bring it to 39th Street. Now, what that means is, of course, making sure that 39th Street is its own vibrant district, but that it too would be walkable, bike friendly, that would have restaurants, coffee shops, patios, bars, clubs, you name it, that was what I had in mind for 39th Street. But to get there, we had to write that history. We had to bring together all the different people who were currently on 39th Street, and we had to work with the city to create 39th Street as a district, and we did. And because of that, beginning in 2017, we were able to put funding in this city's uh, Better Street, Safer City general obligation bond vote. And this fall, we are going to see where 39th Street, after a lot of talk with people in, not just on 39th Street, but in the community itself, uh, things that they wanted to see on 39th Street. And by Pride 2021, we will see a revitalized 39th Historic District. Ward 2 begins at Northwest 23rd Street, just a little bit north of where Lola and Angelo Scott called home. Ward 2 continues all the way up to 122nd Street. Its eastern boundary is I-235. Its western boundary is Meridian, Lake Hefner, and May Avenue. And within this boundary, that's where we're gonna see other historic districts like the Asian District, Uptown 23rd. We're gonna see the Britain District, the Windsor District. And each one of these had provided me with a roadmap when I wanted to create a revitalization project for the 39th Street District, working with the community. And that's what's coming. Now, I think it's very important for us though to remember that Oklahoma City's LGBT history does not begin in Ward 2. It doesn't even begin on 39th Street. In fact, as you might have guessed, our LGBT community has been here from the very beginning. The very first gay-friendly, queer-friendly establishment was a place called Bishop's Taproom, directly across the street from the historic Skirvent Hotel, also right next door to the historic First National Building. And it was in that building where Bishop's Taproom invited people in during the evenings for entertainment, for shows, uh, for drinks, for company. And for the most part, Oklahoma City Police left them alone. And you have to keep in mind at the time, it was illegal in Oklahoma for anyone to express same-sex attraction to someone of a consensual age. In fact, it was illegal in almost every state in the Union until 1971. Those weren't the other prejudices that existed back then. Unfortunately, the same year that Oklahoma began as a state, our governor, Alfalfa Bill Murray, made his white supremacist views clear. Again, reading from Boomtown, Alfalfa Bill Murray said, quote, we must provide the means for the advancement of the Negro race, he told legislators, and accept him as God gave him to us and use him for the good of society. As a rule, they are failures as lawyers, doctors, and in other professions. He must be taught in the line of his own sphere as porters, black boots, and barbers. Unfortunately, in the years following statehood, quote, streetcars, schools, bathrooms, swimming pools, parks, restaurants, all of Oklahoma's public spaces became strictly divided by race. Intermarriage was outlawed. Literacy tests were imposed on black voters. White voters were exempted by a brazen grandfather clause, which excluded anyone whose grandfather had been eligible to vote before, 19, excuse me, before January 1866, a date, of course, before black citizens were allowed to vote. And so, too, unfortunately, that color line existed north of Northwest 23rd Street. In fact, there's a reason why I have the honor of serving as the first biracial or black person on city council in Ward 2. And that was because home ownership was denied to people of color north of Northwest 23rd Street. And with that denial came the denial of being able to pass down generational wealth that comes with home ownership to the kids and the grandkids and so on and so forth. Now, the good people of Ward 2, they heard my vision of investing in our city and investing in our historic districts and making them walkable and bike friendly and better environments for our children. And they said, we like that guy. 
And they even said, we see his color. We're not colorblind. Color is beautiful. Let's go for it. And in this way, they were honoring what Angelo Scott said when he said there were 26 varieties of wildflowers in the very land here of every color. And it is my hope that as we move forward as an LGBT community and as a city, that we will honor all the beautiful colors that make us who we are. That is my hope for Oklahoma City. Now, unfortunately, there was a time when the Klan marched downtown, and there was a time when our state newspaper actually advocated the Klan marching downtown. There was a time when the first Pride Parade happened in the 1980s here in Oklahoma City, and unfortunately, the Klan had not learned from their mistakes, and there they were, waiting for marchers. What the Klan did not anticipate, however, was the number of people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and our allies, non-binary, who would be there marching arm in arm, side by side, together. And their numbers were just, just beautiful to see, especially compared to the dwindling numbers of the KKK. My hope is that as we move forward, we learn from this history and we do not wallow in despair, but we learn about all the moments of resiliency that have existed in Oklahoma City's LGBT history, such as in 1969, the same year as the historic Stonewall riots in New York City, the birth of the LGBT movement in so many ways. But right here in our own backyard, Paul Thompson, a young lawyer, had gone to a beer bar. And in that beer bar, he kissed three friends on the cheek to say hello. What Paul did not understand was that next to him was an undercover police officer. And he walked outside to see flashing police lights. He was arrested, which was common at the time, because as I said, until 1971, with the exception of the state of Illinois, every single state in the United States of America said same-sex attraction to someone of consensual age was illegal. Paul spent the night in jail, which was common. And in spending the night in jail, he did the unthinkable. He decided that he would fight in court. Remembering he's a young lawyer, he knows that the Constitution is actually on his side. It was just time to make that clear to the judge. The judge agreed, and Paul became the first Oklahoman to challenge that discrimination at the level of law. And together with a young woman named Mary Tyson, he went to Dallas, attended the National Gay and Lesbian uh, Task Force, and learned that we needed two things to really have a vibrant LGBTQ community a community center, and a newsletter. And they set about doing both. The newsletter, Our Time, became the Gayly Oklahoman. And it became a way to inform everybody in the LGBT community of the goings on, what needed doing, and how we could do it together. The year I was born in 1982, Scott Wilson opened Angles. And he designed it after Studio 54, state of the art lights and sound systems, but unfortunately, the law was not on his side. And for the first four months of Angle's opening, so came police brutality. So came the sighting of phantom ordinances. And so it went on and on and on. Until one night, Scott arrived at Angle's to see the police tearing down the entrance into his club. Scott had had enough. And like Paul Thompson before him, he stood up for himself and he sued the city. And his lawyer was actually one of my predecessors here on city council in Ward 2, Eric Groves. They won their lawsuit and they didn't want money. What they wanted was a space, a space where they would be free, not just from police brutality, but unfortunately from the brutality that existed in their everyday lives, from a state newspaper that would publish their home employment, or excuse me, their home address and their place of employment that shamed them from saying who they were in public. That's the 39th Street District. That's where Angles calls home. And it was because people before us were able to create uh, a space for LGBTQ folk, 39th Street exists. That is the history I have learned. And that is the history that together as a city we will honor. In fact, those placemaking improvements start this fall and by Pride 2021, we will see them in action. As we move forward into this new vision of what 39th Street will be, we must remember that all of those colors of those wildflowers must be 
our guide in accepting everyone of every skin color, of every religion, of every background on 39th Street District. Too much violence and too much brutality and too much hate has come before us not to meet this moment. My hope is that in those coffee shops and in those restaurants and bars, we hear everything from country music to punk rock, from dance music to rap, to Tupac, to Biggie, to Kendrick. Heck, throw in some Shania Twain for fun. All of this music is what flows into the ears of so many LGBTQ people. And it's that music that must flow through the speakers on 39th Street. We must honor all the different people who make up Oklahoma City's LGBT community. And I am honored to do that work beside you. And it is with that, I would like to read to you then this month's Pride Proclamation. Whereas the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities of Oklahoma City are an indispensable part of the vibrant and diverse culture of Oklahoma City. And whereas Oklahoma City is celebrating its 33rd annual Pride Week coinciding with the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, which marks the beginning of the modern LGBTQ rights movement. And whereas Oklahoma City Pride is a celebration of the LGBT community a demonstration of continued commitment to full equality under the law and an opportunity for visibility and community building for the LGBT community. And whereas across the city, state and nation, tremendous progress has been made toward the goal of full equality for the LGBTQ people. And whereas the city of Oklahoma City remains committed to protecting the rights of LGBTQ residents, fostering a culture of diversity and inclusion, and continuing the work to ensure full equality for LGBTQ residents of Oklahoma City. Now, therefore, Mayor David Holt, the mayor of Oklahoma City, does hereby proclaim June 20th as LGBTQ Pride Month. In the city of Oklahoma City, and encourage residents to celebrate the contributions of the LGBT community, affirming our commitment to equality for all residents of Oklahoma City. As Ward 2 Councilperson, I undersign that proclamation. I wish it were a happier pride, but I suspect that within our history, we will continue to find stories of excellence, resilience, and persever perseverance, excuse me. And with that, we will see a happier pride and happier prides to come. Thank you so much.